now being recorded. First of all, let me thank all of you for coming to this fourth edition of uh, what we call the History of Ideas program. And this is the fourth time we are running it successfully on different history of science and technology, different interesting ideas in uh, scientific history. And today we have very, two very distinguished speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Sunil Mukhi, who is a very distinguished physicist, a string theorist himself, currently a scientific associate at CERN and also associated with ICTS. He was formerly a professor at uh, ISER Pune and before that a professor at TIFR Mumbai. Sunil has a very illustrious career and contributed significantly to our understanding of quantum field theory, string theory, and black holes. Our second speaker is Professor Anirvan Dasgupta, who is a leading expert of anything related to computers, computer science, artificial intelligence, and many things. He is currently a chair professor at Indian Institute of Technology, Gandhinagar. Anirvan also has an illustrious career, and he's also a very well-known teacher at our institute. So I thank both of them that they have agreed to uh, give their time and agreed to give seminar at this series. So without much delay, let us start. The first lecture is by Professor Sunil Mukhi. Sunil, it's up to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shudipto. It's a pleasure and honor to be talking in this series, which I think is in its fourth or more. I don't know how many iterations there have been, uh, the history of ideas. I think it's a fantastic uh, proposal to have such a series and, uh, and carry it out. And I, I also want to congratulate IIT Gandhinagar for a very, uh, I think what I see as a very successful outreach program uh, with many good talks. So I'll try to lower their standard a little bit in my talk, but I think on average, they have been doing it uh, very well. And uh, I hope they do many more. Okay, so uh, my talk is designed for students who are curious about physics, but not necessarily very uh, informed about details of it. And I hope it will be accessible. So here is a standard disclaimer in case uh, anyone wants to know where I got my images. I stole them from the net usually. Um, and uh, then here is a quote, which I think uh, from this wise gentleman who is an inspiration to all of us. And uh, I, have a, I have very strong opinions on the subject of free speech. So I will be using my free speech to give this talk. And, uh, but I also use it to think about things and express my opinions. And uh, my hope is that all of you will uh, do the same. So today I'm going to talk about a historical uh, development, but I'm going to try and analyze it in a, in a context. In a, in a, uh, this is my... Uh, sort of uh, attempt at some, uh, maybe you might call it a cheap uh, uh, the theory of science or philosophy of science. Uh, I'm not an expert, but this is something that I try to talk about. Once I, so this will be quite a long introduction, which will not directly talk about string theory. And after that, I will get to the uh, origins of string theory. And this is the uh, historical part of the talk. In fact, all the talk will be historical. Uh, I'll talk about the insights arising out of string theory and I'll conclude by trying to sort of say a little bit about where are we or what have we achieved in this subject which about which so much is said in, in social media and in, in public and also in, in, sci in scientific uh, uh, journals and conferences. So before that, I'd like to advertise an article that I wrote eight years ago in Current Science. So if you just uh, Google Current Science and my name, and if you remember the title, uh, you will find it. It's free to download. And it kind of uh, contains an important, uh, it, it contains the ideas behind the very first 10 minutes of this talk. Okay, so what are frameworks? So in physics, we study subjects like classical mechanics, statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics, they're part of every syllabus. Now, sometimes we use words like quantum theory, but there's really no such thing in my opinion. Uh, as you may notice, we don't use classical theory or statistical theory, we only use quantum theory for some reason. But actually these frameworks are on similar footing. They're all frameworks, I'll explain. And they should be called uh, as frameworks and not as theories. 
A framework is a set of objects and rules to manipulate them. And uh, here are some examples of uh, the objects that arise in the subjects I listed above. The concept of the object particle is an object, trajectory, a Hamiltonian, a wave function, ensemble, eigenstate. Okay. Now these all sound like something in physics, but I claim that we that is jumping to a conclusion. There is no direct path from any of these concepts to an experiment. Leading from these concepts to experiment needs to interpret them, to measure them uh, requires a lot of uh, more structure than just the object contents. Let me substantiate this point by making a very strong uh, statement. Quantum mechanics does not make any predictions. And let me explain why I say that. Here is a very famous equation. And this equation, Schrodinger equation, tells us nothing unless we specify the potential. So just saying quantum mechanics tells me this uh, does not tell me anything about the system. For example, uh, depending on V of X, the system may or may not have a stable ground state. It may or may not have a zero point energy. There are systems with no zero point energy. It may or may not have quantized energy levels. Again, there are systems in which energy levels are not quantized, but continuous. It may or may not have degeneracies. So all these buzzwords like zero point energy and quantized energy levels, uh, they don't arise at this stage. Here's an equation from the framework. And unless we know something more about it, we can't really conclude anything about physics, about experiment. Now, I'll come back to it, but we move on to a more general framework, which is more powerful than quantum mechanics. Uh, and this is what you might call a many body framework, while quantum mechanics in some sense uh, works with fixed number of objects. So in quantum mechanics, this is the one body Schrodinger equation. I can have two body or five body or N body, but I can't have one equation which incorporates any number of bodies, arbitrary number. Quantum field theory does that. And so it allows for things like creation and annihilation of particles, which ordinary quantum mechanics struggles with. Now, what are the abstract objects of quantum field theory? So you might have seen notations like this, phi of x is a scalar field, psi of x is a fermion field, a mu of x is a vector field with that index mu going over 0, 1, 2, and 3. But none of them is tied to any specific particle. You may be reminded of some particle when you see these notations, but that's strictly your problem. They don't belong to any particle. For example, a scalar can, phi can be a pion, or it can be a Higgs boson, it could be a glue ball. A fermion psi could be a quark or a lepton or a proton. A vector a mu can be a photon or W boson or gluon or even rho meson, which is what originally people tried to fit it with. So you see that quantum field theory is a framework with abstract objects which satisfy certain rules, but it's not tied to any experiment or any specific physics. It can be tied to physics if we do some extra work. Okay, now, by the way, uh, I made it look like quantum field theory is there only to describe elementary particles, but in condensed matter physics, quantum fields describe quasi particles or collective excitations. And they have names like phonons, magnons, plasmons, polarons. So, you know, there are lots of different excitations which can be described using, oh, and excitons, I forgot, uh, which can be described using QFT. It's a very powerful framework, not tied to any specific system. Okay, now to tie it to a system, to tie any framework to a system, we need a model. And that's how we can extract physics. So what's a model? I said a framework is a set of objects and some rules. A model is a concrete proposal to interpret those objects and rules in terms of a physical system. So it describes the system in terms of a given framework. Now, there are words that we throw around like falsifiable, and I want to emphasize with examples for you that a framework is not falsifiable, okay? The reason, let's think clearly why it's not falsifiable. Well, classical mechanics, is it falsifiable? If you say yes, then I would point out that it is falsified. If it's falsified, why on earth are we teaching it? Is a, why are we teaching a false framework in our schools and colleges. Now we are still teaching it, right? Classical mechanics. 
Okay, but it doesn't apply to everything. It doesn't work everywhere. So a framework is not falsified or is not true or false. The only test for it is whether in that framework you can make useful models or you can't. And if you any framework where you can't make useful models gets abandoned, and uh, I want to emphasize does not get abandoned by some uh, government passing a law, it gets abandoned slowly when people realize that it's not working well and other frameworks are working better for them. Physicists are very practical people. They'll keep trying to use some framework as long as it works and they'll abandon it shamelessly when it stops working. So why do we teach classical mechanics? Well, it's used, it, I need to know it if I want to build a bridge or a rocket. Okay, but it's no use to me or not much use to me if I want to understand the hydrogen atom. So I use it where it's useful. I don't use it where it's not useful. And this is a different kind of mean, uh, statement than saying it is true or false. Okay, now let's look at a model. Is a model falsifiable? Well, yes, I mean, I can make a model of something and then it can disagree with the experiment. Okay, but we don't, usually say that the model is falsified. You may like to say that, but we don't say that. And no physicist says that. One example, not in my slides, is Fermi liquid theory. It's good for certain things, which we call Fermi liquids. It's bad for other things. And we say those things are not Fermi liquids. So did Fermi liquid theory get falsified? No, again, it's useful to describe some systems. It's useless to describe other systems. So it's not, a good concept to use falsifiable even for a model. Okay, so the best thing to do is to put this idiotic word out of your mind and try to understand why frameworks and models are useful to understand nature. Okay, now uh, an example will really help us to put these statements in context. Here's the first model that was formulated within the framework of quantum field theory, it's called quantum electrodynamics. Now it turns out quantum electrodynamics is an accurate model for electrons. It's a very approximate model for protons. You can try using it, it gives you some crude answers. They're not great, but they're not too bad either. It's a useless model to describe neutrinos because neutrinos have no electric charge. Nothing stops you writing the model for neutrinos, it just doesn't describe them very well. Okay, same model has uh, different features when you try to use it in different ways. Okay, now there's more. Even for electrons, uh, QED, quantum electrodynamics, disagrees with experiment. For example, if I take electron positron scattering and calculate it, uh, it in QED and measure it in an accelerator, I get different answers because it turns out QED doesn't know anything about the Z boson, which also contributes to this process, okay? So even QED is not complete. Still, I say it's an accurate model. Well, it's accurate whenever I can neglect the contribution of this Z boson, okay? So there are always ifs and buts when we say these things. We do not conclude that QED is falsifiable. Nobody is searching for... Uh, to falsify or not falsify QED. Okay, what we say instead is, well, it's part of a bigger model, the standard model of particle physics, which includes QED and also weak and strong interactions. But even the standard model is not expected to predict all experiments correctly. For example, the existence of dark matter is not explained by the standard model. Okay, and it's an experimental fact as far as we know. Still, it has a huge domain of validity because it describes all known elementary particles, all, and their interactions to very high precision. And this sentence is a kind of statement of what we consider a really good model. Okay, now uh, let me quote for you something very uh, amusing. There's a history behind this. Von Neumann said to Enrico Fermi, with four parameters, I can fit an elephant and with five, I can make it wiggle its trunk. And uh, here is a picture of the best elephant you can actually plot with four parameters. Uh, so you can uh, go to Wikipedia and there are, there's a nice article in American Journal of Physics, which actually gives you the mathematics of this curve. 
And with four parameters, you get this black outline, which supposedly is an elephant. And uh, with the fifth parameter, you can make the trunk go to that pink or blue thing, so you can wiggle its trunk. Okay, so this is to say that models do have parameters and the usefulness of a model, uh, in some sense, it goes down with the number of parameters and it goes up with the number of things the model can describe. So now let's look at the standard model. Well, it has by last at the last count, 26 parameters, which is a lot more than four. So it should be able to describe an elephant and make it not only wiggle its trunk, but even make it uh, use its trunk to uproot a tree. But in fact, it does something much better than that. Look at this poor drawing of an elephant. This honestly isn't even much like an elephant and it's the best you can do with four parameters. The standard model with these 26 parameters describes an entire zoo of particles, not just one animal and everything they can do. I should have not written everything they do. I should have written everything they can do. Okay, and uh, this is a very, very striking fact. This is a fact we should never lose sight of. In this sense, it's a superior model to a model that might explain only an elephant, or in this case, the four parameter model, which only explains the outline of the elephant, doesn't tell you the color, doesn't give you any details of how it looks. So the standard model is a very good model for this reason. Now, uh, by the way, in a minute, I'll pause for questions. I do like questions, and I don't know if the organizers have a mechanism for people to unmute and ask questions, but they certainly should have. If you can't, then put it in the chat, and I'll see it there. You can put questions anytime in the chat. Okay. Now, uh, actually, let me pause right now for questions. Are there any questions? Shudipto, is it going okay? Am I being heard? Am I just talking? There is a, there is, there's a question anybody in Anybody have any question, you can uh, yeah. open your yeah. mind and directly answer. Yeah, yeah. Was the eye of the elephant part of the model? So I have not gone through this in that much detail, but I did read about the eye. Let me tell you, it seems what I could find out is that without the eye and without the wiggling trunk, uh, you get this outline <laughs> with, four, with four parameters. And now when I add a fifth parameter, I get the eye and the trunk is actually a rotation. I mean, this red and blue are rotation around that eye. So the eye comes apparently from the fifth parameter. Okay, any more? Yeah, there's one more question. What is the reason between sem semantic description between they do and they can do? Yeah, I, maybe I, uh, I overstated it. There's not much semantic description, but I, what I want to say is that it describes everything they can possibly do, okay? So you, you might think of doing something with, you might think of smashing some elementary particles together tomorrow, which has never been done before, okay? And the standard model uh, has, we believe has the capability, it has built in the formulae to describe even that, okay? So this is my reason for the sem semantic insistence on everything they can do. I wanted it more to be relevant to that elephant, which can not only wiggle its trunk, it can do a lot more things than wiggle its trunk. Okay. Does this mean that higher the parameters, the better the model will perform? Absolutely, Nishche, that's exactly the point. Okay. Uh, but uh, that makes the model worse, paradoxically, because how much benefit do I get? How, much, how useful is it? Well, if with 200 parameters, I can describe one polymer, I've done nothing because probably without any physics, I can describe the behavior of one polymer or one some material with a suitable number of parameters. Can that model describe another polymer? Or do I need another 200 parameters for that? Then the model is really weak. So a more parameter model in general is weak. Okay, and standard model looks weak with 26 parameters until you realize that it describes not just one type of particle like electron or one interaction like electrons with photons, but Z, W bosons, all the quarks, all the leptons, neutrinos, you name it, all the particles we know. It is this thing which makes it a superior model to a model that 
uh, I don't know, writes down some particular, uh, you know, nearest neighbor interaction to describe one particular lattice system. The problem with uh, the lattice, that system is that then you can't transport it to any other physics. While standard model works on Earth, it works on the moon, it works in astrophysics, it works wherever it's tested, and it works for everything known. Okay, renormalization part of framework or model, Rahul. I will come back to that. I will come back to that. In fact, I'm mentioning it in my talk. Okay, now it's not always obvious. Uh, this is exactly uh, Rahul's question. It's not always obvious whether some given feature belongs to a model or a framework. Okay. Uh, for example, the Higgs mechanism uh, looks like a property of the standard model, but it's actually a framework feature of QFT. And let me show you why I say that. Interestingly, it was Phil Anderson in 1963 who proposed this mechanism. I've read the paper, so these are not, I'm not digesting other opinions. I read all the papers associated to Higgs mechanism. And it was Anderson who clearly had the mechanism, but he said, I'm going to illustrate my mechanism in an electron plasma. And Higgs and Ongler and Braut, apparently not knowing about Anderson's work, rediscovered it in the context of particle physics, which is done in a vacuum rather than a plasma. Okay, and you can see by the fact that it works in two different subjects, uh, a condensed matter system and a particle physics system, that it can't be a model of a feature, it has to be a framework feature. In fact, technically, and don't mind if you don't follow these words, it holds in any gauge invariant system with a charge scalar particle or condensate in a suitable potential. It doesn't depend on other details of the models. Sure, you need some conditions for it to operate, but those conditions apply in a very wide class of models, not just in a particular model. In fact, Weinberg and Salam then use this. Uh, this mechanism in their standard model, but it also applies in our understanding of Meissner effect or superfluidity or various other things, okay? They are all interrelated. So these are framework features of QFT. Okay, now why do we have frameworks and models? Well, both are a means to a goal. A goal is a specification of what system we want to understand and very important, what degree of understanding would satisfy us. Okay, uh, there's, I should have put this quote here. I think in next version of the talk, I'll put it. Uh, Hawking, Stephen Hawking famously said, my goal is nothing less than a complete understanding of the world we live in. Well, that, that was uh, really a typically overstated goal of Hawking. He didn't achieve anything like that. He achieved a very important understanding of some part of the world we live in. Um, so we need to be realistic and specify degree of understanding as well. Now, when we consider what's a goal and why it, what it's good for, we should think of two things. Is it acceptable or relevant? Now, these are sociological opinions. These are not strictly only scientific. For example, different people differ on which goals are more important, okay? Uh, some people actually think certain goals are not valid. And usually if you look at those people with a microscope, you would find that they actually don't understand what that goal is and they're giving an opinion without understanding. And since I advocated free speech in the beginning of this talk, they are fully entitled to give their opinion without understanding. We are also fully entitled to point out that that opinion is without understanding. Okay. The second consideration is how useful is a given framework and its model in achieving the goal, okay? And this is a two-step process. So to achieve a goal, first you need to fix a framework, then you need to find a model. And the, the winning one is the one that's useful. And in fact, here is where the sort of the Nobel Prize comes in. If the goal is describing some very important physical system, uh, and in particular, some important experimental fact, then uh, you can choose the right framework and model. And if you can achieve that description, you will get a Nobel Prize uh, for theory. And uh, the experimentalist who does that experiment also importantly has to use some framework and model to interpret it. So the framework and model is crucial in achieving anything that we call success. 
Now, point one can be controversial, I just said. The second one, on the other hand, is much clearer. Hmm? People, when they see a Nobel Prize winner, they may say, well, it's not the best of the year, but they usually don't say, well, this wasn't an important discovery. Hmm? Utility is usually clear. Now, there's some history, since this is the history of ideas talk. Uh, a famous debate between Phil Anderson and Steve Weinberg was about the relative importance of emergent phenomenon versus fundamental constituents. Here's Anderson and his book. Here's Weinberg and his book. Both the people uh, had Nobel Prizes. Uh, both of them are no more. Both their books still exist, and you can read them. Uh, this debate touched upon the philosophy of reductionism, and it even impacted plans for funding future experiments. So there's a long history, which you'll find in Weinberg's book, at least, maybe also in Anderson's book, which I remember a bit less. Lest you be tempted as a student to get into this debate, let me remind you that history judges both of them to be brilliant scientists. And maybe it's better for a student to focus on that aspect rather than judging the debate on one side or the other. Okay, uh, good. Now some audit, Now we finally get to string theory. It's almost, uh, it's uh, 25 minutes into the talk and we are now going to talk about string theory. In the 90s, 1950s and 1960s, Dozens of strongly interacting particles were being discovered in experiments, and experimenters could measure their masses and their spins. J uh, is the intrinsic angular momentum or spin of a particle, and mass, of course, you know. And they found that they were, they were discovering in their labs families of particles with increasing mass with a quadratic relation to the spin. That means for each spin, they were finding a particle with mass squared linearly proportional to the spin. And so if we plot J versus M squared for many particles, we'll find straight lines, which today are called J trajectories. And here is a plot of them. And you see that these are, this is an, probably an old plot, but you see that whatever it is, some of them have only two uh, particles on the line and any two particles uh, line will pass through, but they're all parallel lines. Don't forget that. That's very non-trivial. Okay. So the fact that all these things lie on parallel lines actually tells me that I must have a formula like this, where alpha prime, the coefficient of M squared is the same for all the families, all the trajectories, but alpha zero, the intercept is different. Okay. And alpha prime has a name, it's called the Rege slope, and alpha zero is called the Rege intercept. Well, the number of these particles and these regularities remained a mystery. People asked, why do so many of these hadrons, strongly interacting particles, exist? Why do they form Rege trajectories? Are they made up of something else? And finally, in the 1960s, experiments revealed that they actually are made up of something else. For example, a proton uh, in this experiment, this yellow line, a wiggly line is a photon that's going inside the proton and seeing what's sitting inside. And it's seeing that there are point-like particles called quarks inside this red sphere, which depicts the proton. A very, very key experiment in history. And it raised a beautiful puzzle. The quarks seem to be weakly interacting among themselves but they were stuck inside this hadron. They couldn't seem to be liberated. Even by with a very strong photon in this figure, uh, you could not knock one of the quarks out. So there were three observations to be reconciled. One is, why does this picture uh, produce linear rigid trajectories, which are observed? Uh, why are quarks weakly interacting inside their corresponding meson or baryon? And why are they not seen? as isolated particles. Is something strong holding them in? Paradoxically, the same thing is weak after they are held in because among themselves inside that ball, the interactions are very weak. And this led to the first string model proposed by these two gentlemen, Suskind, uh, who is still around and active, and Nambu, who is unfortunately no more, uh, who proposed a rubber band or string model of the meson. Of, the, of, of strongly interacting particles, but I'm illustrating it with a meson, which is a bound state of Q and Q bar, quark and anti-quark. Now, the idea was that there's a fundamental object that's really connecting every 
quark with a corresponding antiquark, and that's called a string. And in fact, I found a very interesting historical uh, story. Uh, Dirac almost anticipated the idea and spoke about it in Bombay in 1955. Uh, this is a quote from his Bombay lecture that I was able to find online, that we may regard classically uh, an electron as the end of a Faraday line of force. The electric field forms discrete Faraday lines of force, which are to be treated as physical things like strings. One has then to develop a dynamics for such a string-like structure and quantize it. So Dirac, in some sense, anticipated in 1955 the developments from that happened from the 90, late 1970s or late 1960s. But he was mistaken. The electromagnetic lines of force are not well described by this model, by this picture. And the reason is this picture, this yellow ball you see with the wiggly string is nothing like lines of force because lines of force uh, between uh, say a North Pole and a South Pole of a magnet or electric charge uh, spread out, okay? They, they don't just go straight, they spread in all directions, they go to infinity, they curve round and they come back and that's not at all like a string. They are not collimated. However, turns out that the string that Nambu and Suskind were talking about is collimated. We now know this. And so Dirac was right, but about the wrong system. And this is again, a very important uh, lesson in physics. It's very common to be right about the wrong system because the correct statements are framework features that you, the person has in mind Dirac had an intuition for how quantum theory and electrodynamics work, but that wasn't exactly the right model in which to use it. That's a small digression, let me move on. So this quantized relativistic string that Nambu Saskain proposed will have particle-like excitations representing its normal modes. Any string has that, okay? And these now you can quantize the string and compute the uh, angular momentum and masses of these excitations, okay? It's interesting, it's non-trivial and interesting that they have angular momentum at all. You may wonder what they are whirling around. They're not whirling around anything. They are just excitations of a relativistic string, but relativity is a very curious beast. When you have excitations of a string in relativity, they actually come with their own spin. And not only that, they lie on rigid trajectories. Brilliant observation, where uh, the angle of the spin is proportional to m squared precisely, okay, with a coefficient which is related to the tension of the string t. It's basically two pi inverse. So Reges parameter alpha prime is two pi inverse. And that other thing alpha zero is the intercept. Now at a qualitative level, this proposal explained all three experimental puzzles at once. We don't give enough credit for this, maybe get enough people, these people, Nambu and Suskind, don't always get enough credit for this idea outside the immediate string community. Let me highlight this. Rigid trajectories were observed experimentally. The string idea explains them right away. As it's a basic principle of string theory. It's a basic outcome of string theory that this formula holds. J equals constant times M squared plus another constant. They also explain why quarks are weakly interacting at short distances, because if I have two objects close by connected by a constant tension string, which behaves like a rubber band, well, it's quite slack at short distances. We know that rubber band is slack at short distances, so it doesn't really influence the force between them that much. But if I try to remove one of them from the other, now my string has to stretch, okay? And once it stretches, it contains enormous energy due to its tension. Tension times length is energy, okay? And it is this which keeps them essentially confined. So the fact that quarks are confined inside hadrons, that they are weakly interacting inside hadrons, and that hadrons form rigid trajectories. All of them qualitatively come out from this proposal of strings. But there are obstacles to extracting more precise results, and those obstacles, have, they have improved a lot, but they're still present in some form today. So at this point, I should say string theory is a framework that's obvious. Uh, because it deals with an abstract string-like object. And 
only when you use Nambu and Saskain's proposal to interpret it as the reason, as the as the thing that creates a force between quarks and uh, and quarks, quarks and antiquarks or quarks among each other, then you would make a model of it. And it's the these are framework predictions. They are true. Uh, but the model predictions would have better, you know, detail. They would tell you much more things like what is the actual formula for this weak force or strong force? What is the actual value of this tension? Can we measure it in experiment? Those are the parts which have not yet succeeded fully. Now, string theory is a deformation of quantum field theory, just as quantum mechanics is a deformation of classical mechanics. And in both cases, there's a parameter. So in quantum mechanics, there's a Planck constant which, uh, from which we recover classical mechanics in the limit h goes to zero. In string theory, there's a tension T or there's a Rege parameter one by T and we re uh, recover QFT as T goes to infinity. Infinite tension string means all strings collapse to points. And so we are back to point particles which are the subject of QFT. Moreover, T has dimensions of energy squared, okay? In, in, in relativistic units, uh, tension is energy per unit length, but length itself has inverse dimensions of energy if you use H bar and C in it. And therefore you find that E over root T is dimensionless. That means that T going to infinity is the same as energy going to zero or low energy. So at low energy is compared to root T, string theory actually reduces to QFT, okay? So this I want to emphasize, the framework is a departure from particle physics of quantum field theory, but it's not a radical departure. It has a natural limit where it goes back to QFT and that natural limit is low energy compared to the square root of the string tension. Now, how low is that energy depends on what is the string tension, which I haven't yet told you. Okay, good. Uh, I'll go on to tell you a few more things about string theory and then about models, but let's take a couple of questions. Uh, why is there a notion that an improvement over standard model will get rid of the free parameters? I think here there is a historic, there's some historicity in it because, um, Oh, yeah, these are both very good questions. They're a little more technical than I want to go into. But for example, the um, Maxwell's improvement of electrodynamics with unified electricity and magnetism made it clear that there is only one coupling constant in the whole game. If electricity and magnetism were two separate forces, they could each interact with their own natural strength. Hmm? But that's not what happens. Experimentally, that's not what happens. And by improving the original way of thinking, you know, when I was really uh, quite young, like six or seven, I remember my elder brother had two textbooks uh, for his physics course, one called uh, electricity and the other called magnetism. Okay, there are no longer two textbooks for this subject. So you see that uh, improvement over a model does actually get rid of many freedoms, including the free parameters. Uh, as for rigid trajectories from QCD, that's a subject of active study. And uh, I think there is some understanding, quite a lot of understanding, but I feel we are still short of a very precise uh, and maybe simple derivation of it. Okay, that's what I can say here. Okay, good. Okay, now uh, let's talk about, come back to QFT and renormalization, which somebody raised. So QFT is a great framework and it's the best framework that's been experimentally verified. That is who, which makes models that are experimentally verified. Okay, but it has a very generic problem uh, when we compute higher order corrections in the perturbation series. And to fix this problem, we need something called renormalization. And it's a very complicated technical procedure, which is a little bit unpleasant to carry out. Uh, and it's one of the most advanced things we teach when we teach QFT. And if we try to incorporate gravitation within QFT, the problem becomes worse. And even this complicated procedure doesn't seem to work. At least people have tried for decades and it has never worked. But the string framework is intrinsically finite 
uh, at, in the ultraviolet. I shouldn't have maybe used UV, it may confuse you. It's intrinsically finite in perturbation theory. Its perturbative corrections are all finite, okay? And the reason is that these uh, infinities that arose in QFT, uh, they come from the possibility, theoretical possibility of particles getting arbitrarily close, but strings are fuzzy objects. They can't get arbitrarily close. A string, when it, you know, when strings come close enough to touch, there's still part of the string that's not exactly overlapping with the other one. So there's a fuzziness in the string. And so a string string scattering diagram looks a bit like this. And you see that at any instant, this is the string and this is the direction it's propagating. I hope you can see my cursor like this. And there's no sharp interaction point in this diagram. That's a crude way of arguing that there are no uh, infinities and uh, actual calculations show very precisely that there are not. So UV finiteness is a key proved feature of the string framework. Now you can debate rigorous proof or not rigorous proof, but the proof is at a highly technical calculational level. It's not just words. So there's something good about string theory, which is not good in quantum field theory. Okay, there's another good thing about the framework which is this. So students who have learned uh, some QFT, may not be all of you, maybe many of you, uh, know all these formulae. Uh, the first one is the Yang-Mills uh, theory. The second one is the Dirac theory of photons and or more general particles coupled to fermions. And the third one is Einstein's general relativity. Okay, now the interesting thing is when the string framework reduces to QFT, it doesn't reduce orbit in an arbitrary way. It reduces by producing precisely these types of interactions. It's not an assumption. We don't put it in, it comes out. It's literally true that if I did not know the nature of the Yang-Mills interaction or the Einstein interaction, I could have discovered it independently through string theory. It's not how history actually worked, but an alternative history could have possibly worked in this direction. So the low energy spectrum of the relativistic string does include massless spin one and spin two particles. We know that the spin one particles uh, produce um, uh, Yang-Mills like particles, uh, uh, correspond to Yang-Mills like particles, W, Z, gluons and so on. And we know that spin two particle corresponds to the graviton, the field of gravity. Okay, but we also know that their self couplings are embodied in these interactions. And as I said, those self couplings actually come out. So this strongly suggests these two features. I want to highlight these two, they are framework features. One is finiteness of the perturbation uh, series. And second is low energy reduction to familiar experimentally verified theories of quantum field theory, models of quantum field theory suggests that strings are a natural framework to describe particle physics and gravity. Okay, now the Nambu Suskind project collapsed, not because it failed, but because it was struggling to produce a detailed model and a much better model came out uh, directly with the quantum field theory framework without using string theory. It was a QFT model that came out. And this model due to Gross, Wilczek and Politzer uh, was based on a framework calculation, which anyone could have done who understood the QFT framework even many years before them, which showed that strong interactions can become weak at short distances if certain uh, conditions are satisfied. That means the strength of the interaction evolves as a function of the distance over which it acts. And this led immediately, this realization immediately led to a model in QFT framework uh, called quantum chromodynamics or QCD, where instead of a string, we have gluons, which are actual particles mediating the force between quarks. So it looked like this killed the string idea because this model worked and we didn't need strings, we just needed ordinary particles. Moreover, it was calculationally quite successful and it has been enormously successful uh, for about 50 years now, maybe exactly 50 years. I think this is the 50th anniversary of the Gross-Wilczek Pulitzer papers. 
But gluons actually effectively, if you calculate and simulate, you can get, you can show that they create a narrowly collimated flux associated to them, not an electric flux, but a color flux as it's called. And it behaves not so far from being a string. Okay, so the left side of this picture is Nambu and Saskine's fundamental string. The right side of this picture is an effective flux tube uh, created by gluons, which unlike the flux tube created in electromagnetism, doesn't spread out. It actually has approximately constant tension. So these two sides qualitatively match. The problem is from 73 all the way to today, QCD has always been ahead in making numerical predictions that can be fitted with data at colliders, okay? And so the framework of string theory got a, somewhat abandoned for the framework of QFT and the model of Nambu Saskine got abandoned for the model of QCD. But today, every QCD practitioner not only uses the intuition which came from Nambu and Saskind's string model, but actually they're constantly producing evidence that it's pretty close to the truth. So it's a work in progress, but it's not a failure. It got abandoned in a way because something better came along, but I don't think anybody seriously argues that the string model needs to be abandoned. People say we get different insights from the two models. In particular, when the string becomes long at long distances, QCD loses its calculability, at least its easy calculability. You have to use computers, lattice gauge theory, and so on. And the string models predictions are actually best at those long distances. So there's a complementarity. We gain by using both frameworks and both models and keeping them in our minds. Okay. Now I'll come to some problems with uh, the st string theory, yes. Yes, Arnab says we know this has to be the case due to constraints of the interactions of massless particles. I think he's referring to the fact that at low energies, strings uh, reduce uh, to these interactions. I was describing it as a miracle. Arnab is saying uh, it's not a miracle. If you know anything about how relativity works and gauge principle works, then you'll come to the same conclusion. Of course, you're right. But looking at the literature, Arnab, I am not at all sure that what you know now uh, was known at the time uh, the first low energy effective action of string theory was found. Okay, of you. course, if we if we knew how gauge principle and uh, 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 general coordinate invariance principles work, we also didn't need Einstein or Hilbert or Yang Mills to write those interactions. Everything, everything follows from that. But I think what we know about these symmetries, gauge symmetry and general coordinate invariance uh, comes from these facts. So, yeah, but thanks for raising that. It's again, in a way, the fact that string framework has taught us something which is like eternal, which is valid and true, regardless of what, the, what models the framework may or may not produce, okay. Now, in the last 15 minutes of my talk, where surprisingly I'm doing quite okay in time, uh, I will talk about problems with the QCD string and why it got stuck. Stuck. Now, Nambu already noted that the QCD string that he proposed has pathologies. And there are two important ones. One is that it contains tachyons, which although the word is used to describe particles traveling faster than light, that's not what it contains. Uh, the correct uh, way to think of it is the tachyon is just a shorthand word for some kind of instability of the vacuum. Okay, even the Higgs particle, if expanded around the origin is a tachyon. And it just says that the origin is unstable and it needs to have a vacuum expectation value. And this is a comment for the experts. But here uh, the tachyon, the instability could also be very serious. In fact, uh, among uh, various people, importantly, Ashok Sen has given arguments uh, that the um, string in this form has a has a, how to say, terminal instability. Namely, its potential is not just unstable, that is bending this way instead of bending upwards, but at least on one side, it goes down to minus infinity. So there's no stable vacuum at all. Okay, that's one problem. The second problem was what are called ghosts. 
again this is just a word the real technical meaning is negative probability states states with negative norm norms give us probabilities so they are unphysical states with negative probability so these were two problems built into it this is a quote from nambu's own paper saying that uh, mentioning both negative probabilities and tachyon he was perfectly aware of it you might even say that all the effort from then till now for 50 years to make a qcd string work is to cure these two problems in a sensible way and then make models well there was a technical there is a technical solution it may not be the only one but it's a good one we generalize Uh, the strings of nambu and suskind to have a new symmetry called supersymmetry that was actually first discovered exactly in this context that has a property of removing this instability what it does is that with this symmetry the generic potential in the string is not this funny thing with a bottomless minimum but instead it becomes one with a pot uh, potential rising on both sides which we know to be the correct potential for any system okay because once there's a potential like that then the field can settle into a stable minimum and it won't roll further and we won't have instability also if we assume that the equations of the string have a technical feature called total central charge 15 then that uh, assumption which is arbitrary happens to remove the ghost so the ghost uh, contribution comes out proportional to c minus 15 in the equations so setting c equals 15 you're done with them now there are many ways to achieve string equations which have c equals 15 but one way is to uh, assume that strings propagate in a 10 dimensional space time of which the first factor is minkowski space time approximately and the second factor m prime is a six dimensional compact space i'm sure you've heard about these things from wikipedia and social media and everywhere else the first factor is then identified with our space time while the second is taken to be a compact internal space which uh, actually has uh, needs to have some beautiful properties uh, in order to tie in with physics observations and those properties make it a kalabi yau manifold kalabi and yau were mathematicians who studied a type of manifold and that manifold those manifolds there are billions of them were readily available when needed to satisfy these conditions but note that now we are really talking of a model we are tending to a model okay S saying that c equals 15 is still a framework we can say the framework has a c and i can choose it to be 15 that's still not tied to any model once i start to connect it to physics and say well it means space time is 10 dimensional it means m6 is compact all that then i'm starting to make a model and in fact with these ideas a natural model was found which takes the gauge group or the symmetry group of the standard model which is su3 cross su2 cross u1 unifies this whole product as a subgroup of a single group called e6 which is an exceptional lie group and which in turn is a nice subgroup of e8 which is the ultimate exceptional lie group there are no more exceptional lie groups after that so this look like nature is using fancy mathematics and nature has been known to do that before so people thought it's a good clue and then one more thing happened when checking how to make models of this kind it was found that you can make models which have parity violation matching the observed physics of weak interactions okay and that was quite a stunning discovery because too many things were going right when everything was falling into place okay and uh, the manifold needed for this internal space was a class of manifolds which was known uh, the unification of forces took place in a way that had already been speculated but it was a better more precise model than that and of course it admitted a very important experimental all these are experimental facts uh, the fact that our space time is 3 comma 1 dimensional is experimental the symmetries are experimentally verified as u3 as u2 u1 and parity violation so and there are many others which i have left out with all of these this very influential paper was written in 1985 okay and it seemed miraculous because it had one more 
spin off. Notice that none of these experimental facts really talks about the role of gravity in a big way. But in fact, the model that they formulated could be used not just to understand uh, the standard model particles, but also the graviton, the quantum of gravity. So, and, and it unified them all. So all forces of nature got unified into a single underlying string force, uh, including gravity for the first time. And unification within quantum field theory had not been too successful, even without gravity and with gravity, uh, it could not even be tried. So the string framework was thought to be better to achieve this goal. And I think people who try to unify forces generally agree that the string, string framework is the best framework to try. Okay, there are people who think the goal of unifying forces is bogus and they are entitled under freedom of speech constitution, uh, article 19, section two, I think it is. Uh, as long as they don't uh, threaten national integrity, they can always, uh, you know, uh, claim that um, that um, unification of forces is a bogus goal. It's a pointless goal. That could be. A, that's a matter of opinion. But if that's a goal, then it's generally agreed that all these properties are summarized are the right ones uh, to bring about this goal. Okay, even though the goal hasn't been achieved yet. All forces arise from a single type of string. You don't have electron string, photon string, neutrino string, neut uh, you know, um, uh, quark string. All the different particles in this proposal come from a single string. And that's again, another qualitative framework feature, but everything rests on finding the right model. Okay. Uh, so now actually we have not one, but two different goals for which string theory could be useful. One is the QCD string of Nambu and Susskind, and the other is the fundamental super string whose low energy excitations produce a unified type of theory. So the, these are different goals. QCD is a goal that a lot of people subscribe to, and actually it's very hard to argue against it. Fundamental string has addresses a goal uh, of unification and uh, explanation of forces at high scale, which not everybody will buy. Okay, so the problem is what's the precise model that achieves these goals? And before I get to it, let me say that there's a third goal. And the third goal is understanding quantum field theory itself. The framework of quantum field theory is so complex that in many situations, it's quite intractable. We have equations that even the best computer cannot solve. And as a evidence of that, you will get a million dollars uh, from these people, CMI, not Chennai Mathematical Institute. This is Clay Mathematics Institute in the US. If you can prove confinement of quarks from equations, which you know, okay? Everybody knows those equations. If you can prove the confinement uh, by finding a solution to these equations in the quantum form, then you're done. Quantum form means evaluating a path integral. Uh, and it hasn't been done yet but the string, string framework can potentially help address this. And if it does, then it would have contributed a goal, but not those two goals before, but the goal of understanding QFT. Similarly, the goal of understanding quantum aspects of gravity. I'll call these theoretical goals. They ask what kinds of phenomena can a framework predict? They don't ask what phenomena do our frameworks predict? What kinds are they capable of predicting is the question. They don't require even specific models of nature, nor do they require comparison with experiment. If they illuminate what kind of framework QFT can predict, they've taught us something about the most important framework that's verified, QFT. But for that, we use models which are not realistic, which don't compare to nature, but which are somehow symmetric enough or simple enough that equations can be solved and shown to display features broadly similar to the real world, okay? So the goal here is a different one. Don't look for a model that matches nature, look for a model where you can actually start from the equations and come to some conclusions. Now, roughly the procedure is as follows. I use string theory. I look at a model in string theory. I calculate some consequences. I take the low energy limit, 
then those consequences should apply to quantum field theory. And I may find something that nobody working in quantum field theory for the last seven decades had found. Okay, so that's a third goal. And I think third goal is very important. Okay, it's not a new goal. I'll give you an example of where this goal worked very well. The existence of gravitational waves was debated theoretically for years at a time when many people thought they don't exist. In fact, some of these authors actually wrote that they don't exist, then they wrote that they do exist, then they wrote again that they don't exist. There were papers and anti-papers annihilate, annihilating each other year after year until finally uh, an odd number of papers survived with no anti-papers. And so we have a net uh, belief that they do exist. It was not clear at the time, literally, it was not clear whether the symmetries of gravity uh, make these into some art gauge artifacts rather than real things. Well, this work, which had no foreseeable application to any experiment at the time, was crucial in understanding the LIGO discovery in 2015, which agreed with the final settled conclusion that gravitational waves do exist. Okay, in fact, the people who were doing this were using Einstein's gravity, but what they were doing was applicable to any theory of gravity with those symmetries, even with higher derivative terms or anything. And finally, their conclusions were essential uh, in nailing an important framework feature of all general coordinate invariant systems, whether it is gravity or whether it is even string theory. Okay, now I'll, uh, in my last five, do I have five minutes, uh, Shudipto? Yeah, you can take three minutes, maybe. Three, okay. So three and five is a little different. And uh, I am going to actually go uh, directly to a later slide, though I was going to give you a nice picture of this very nice person, uh, because I think there are still six or seven slides that I don't want to go to. I instead want to, um, I will summarize. Um, let me see the successes of the framework and then go back to uh, my um, uh, uh, my my remaining comments before 1984 we had only quantitative qualitative ideas about electric magnetic duality in field theory today thanks to ashok sen who unfortunately i couldn't show you his slide uh, and cyborg and witten who were inspired by sen's work and said so very clearly we have precise non-perturbative solutions of quantum field theory with the feature of electric magnetic duality. So we know that it's a possible behavior of uh, QFT, but we learned it by sense paper extended by these people using techniques of string theory. Before 1984, Bekenstein and Hawking uh, proposed a formula for the entropy of black holes, which was very miraculous and puzzling and we had no clue what it means. Today, thanks to Strominger and Wafa, and again, Ashok Sen, by the way, played a role in this and such kind, uh, we understand it much more precisely. And we have models, not realistic, but string framework, using string framework, we have models where you can actually calculate the black hole entropy as the contribution from microscopic states of a theory. And therefore we are confident that the black hole entropy is not so mysterious it's similar to the entropy of any other system like a lump of coal. Before 1984, it was thought that gravity might be a holographic force, namely its information can be captured by a screen placed on the boundary of space-time. Today, thanks to Maldasena, we are quite sure that this is true. You may read up more of this yourselves. And before 1984, we thought quantum entanglement and gravity were completely unrelated. Nobody thought of mentioning Einstein Rosen work on entanglement with uh, in the same breath as gravitation. Today we know that gravity is a geometrization of entanglement. These are four utterly profound theoretical discoveries about QFT that were found because of inspiration and calculation from string theory. Okay, so uh, I think that's actually, uh, okay, I think I should just make one more statement and end. I feel that the original buzz of excitement uh, about a unified uh, theory of everything that string theory represented was hugely overhyped in 1984. It's natural 
but it was indeed um, uh, overhyped. And this led to a claim that string theory does not follow the scientific method, does not make predictions, is not falsifiable. I hope I've argued that if we think in terms of framework and model, then falsifiability is not the uh, uh, is not the criterion. The criterion is utility. And it's still true that we don't have a useful unified model of all interactions, nor of the QCD string, but we have come very, very close to both of these. I would say very, very close to the latter, the QCD string, and somewhat close to the former. But the goals remain unachieved. So I think, I hope that this is a kind of balanced view. And I want to end with a picture of this same guy who inspires me a lot. Uh, Einstein said the following, never have I made any systematic effort to fight injustice and suppression. The only thing I did was this, I have expressed an opinion on public issues whenever they appeared to me so bad and unfortunate that silence would have made me feel guilty of complicity. And I want to end on that note, thank you very much. Uh, I hope everyone supports um, this history of ideas series. And I also hope that everyone supports freedom of speech in academia. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Sunil, for this wonderful talk. And we again thanks you from IIT Gandhinagar. And now this uh, we have a few minutes for a few quick questions. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Sunil, if you can see it. They are all technical questions. I think uh, Sambit and Arnab, uh, please discuss or email me. I'll be very happy to uh, address them. Only uh, this uh, Sanchari Biswas's question is not technical. How is string theory fundamentally different from other frameworks of quantum gravity and how successful are they? For example, loop quantum gravity. So I don't want to comment on the success of loop quantum gravity because I usually like to read primary sources before I make up my mind. And honestly, out of my own laziness and old age, I haven't done that properly for loop quantum gravity. But the one place where I have sort of tried to look into it, which is what is the best quantum gravity could do in terms of explaining the uh, Bekenstein-Hawking formula, I do believe that string theory did better. There was actual competition at the in this result. And string theory produced this factor of one by four in the formula, which is not something you put by hand. It's a calculational output, and it's truly amazing. Producing the right number is a really impressive success, and string theory actually did it. You didn't see the formula because of time, but uh, you can trust me there. I think that uh, string theory was very successful. In it. Other than that, I don't want to really try and compare loop quantum gravity. So Arnav, please go ahead. Yeah, so Sunil, I have a general question. So uh, could you make some comment on importance of guess in history of science? And in context of string theory, I'm namely referring to the Venetian amplitude, which is, I think many yeah. of us consider guess, but we cannot uh, ignore the importance. So uh, can you say importance of guess and where we should strike the balance? We, I can't say where we should strike the balance, but I can say guesses are important for the following reason. If you get the guess right, you who make history and get a Nobel Prize. If you get it wrong, you can move on and make a different guess. <laughs> okay, so it's not it's not a very highly risky proposition. Okay, so uh, you should read Weinberg's thoughts about uh, logical positivism in his book. I love that section. I think it's in Dreams of Final Theory. So if you have the e version, you can do a search through the book for logical positivism. And uh, he gives a very nice example based on the electron about the use of, uh, of guesses and conjectures beyond what you actually observe. Thank you. Thank you. 